Okay, so what we're going to be doing today, guys, is we're going to go over uh, some exam level examples, okay, of the law of conservation of energy. Okay, so these would be very much like questions I would make up and put on a unit exam or a final exam. Okay, on the law of conservation of energy, so it gets you some idea of what level of difficulty you're looking at. Okay, we'll uh, finish up the uh, sheet. Okay, if there's time after that. Okay, and when you're done the sheet, if you're, you know, if you're still needing a little bit of time to work on, let's say either of the labs or something like that, we can see what we can arrange for that. Okay, but we want to get through law of conservation. Make today our last day on that. Tomorrow, we'll go over the last thing in this unit, which is efficiency, which is a really easy little lesson. We'll take no time at all. And then on Friday, we'll do unit exam review. I'll give you your unit exam review handout uh, package, whatever, so that you can start your review over the weekend okay, for your exam on December 16th, which is Tuesday of next week. Okay, So that's the plan going forward. Um, and then, obviously, next week is the last week of school before Christmas holidays. Okay, We'll start the last unit and get three, four lessons in. Okay. Um, well, three lessons in, I guess, before uh, before the holiday. All right. And that means, guys, if we stay on track, we should have several days for uh, final exam review in January. Okay, before uh, before final exam start, we should have. Right now, looks like four, three or four days. Okay, to do final exam review in class. All right. So it's looking really good right now. All right, so what I want you guys to do right now is just uh, copy these down. Just copy number one down for now, okay, and then give it a try, okay? I'll give you a few minutes to, to try it yourself, and then we'll go through it together. Remember, it's the law of conservation of energy, so that's EI equals EF, okay? All right, so looking at number one here, the thing we have to understand about going down a hill, okay, is that, again, the energy... In the toboggan, that's a toboggan, okay. and that's a person riding the toboggan, and that is the limit of my artistic ability. Okay, so up here, okay, they're moving um, 14 meters per second. They're moving at 14 meters per second. Okay, and they are 30 meters above. Th the other point that we're dealing with. Shortly thereafter, the sled is moving at 23 meters per second. Doesn't tell us where, but since it's going faster, can we assume it isn't higher than that than the first point? Yeah, and that's something that we just have to understand, okay, uh, as it goes on here for this kind of question. So maybe it's down here, and the guy fell off because it was going so fast. Because I'm not going to draw him again. Okay. Oh no, wait. That would change the mass. Sorry, he has to stay on. All right, he's still on. Hang on for dear life. Okay, and here, okay, we know that he's moving at 23 meters per second. All right. He has kinetic energy and potential energy here at the beginning. And he has, I'm assuming, yeah, I have to assume he has both. Okay. I don't know for sure if he's at the bottom, but guess what? If he is, what will I get for the height? Zero. Okay, it'll end up and I'll solve it and it'll get it'll, it'll come out as zero. Okay, the only problem here is if we get a negative number, okay, which means he dug a hole and fell in it. Okay, hopefully that doesn't happen. All right, but okay. All right, so we got EI equals EF because we know the mechanical energy, the sum of the potential and the kinetic at this point here, is the same as it is down here. All right, so at the top, okay, he has potential and kinetic. And we're assuming that at the bottom, he also has both. All right, so we fill in our formulas here. M times G times HI plus 1 half MVI squared equals MGHF plus 1 half MVF squared. As an aside, going back to the work energy theorem, where did all this mechanical energy come from? Yeah. When you sled down a hill, do you have to pull your sled to the top of the hill? Okay, that's doing work, right? Okay, so that's where all this mechanical energy that we're now calculating about came from. Someone did work, exerted a force over a distance of pulling this thing up the hill. All right, is M in every term? So can I get rid of it? Okay. All right, I'm trying to solve for HF. So what should I move first? 
Right, subtract this first. Move what's not attached. This is not attached. Okay, so we'll have GHI plus one half VI squared minus, okay, one half VF squared. And that's going to equal GHF. Now, how do I get GF, GHF by itself? Evan? Divide by G. Okay. Okay, now we're solving for HF. Most common mistake when people are solving for a height is that they square root for some reason. Okay? They feel that, you know, I always have to square root when I solve for V. I should have to square root every time I do one of these questions. But is that the case? No. H isn't squared. So we don't have to square root. Okay. All right. So when we plug in our numbers here, okay, we're going to have 30, oh, sorry, 9.81 times 30. Okay, um, plus one half times 14 squared minus one half times 23 squared, all over 9.81. Okay, and we'll figure out what that equals. Okay, so 9.81 times 30, okay, plus 0.5 times 14 squared. Oh, missed the four. That's not what I want either. Okay, and then we'll subtract our 0 0.5 times 23 squared. Okay, and then divide that by 9.81. Okay, so they're still 13 meters above the bottom of the hill. All right, does that make sense to everybody? Okay, I mean, really, the skeleton of this is always the same, right? Okay, and let me show you kind of where you would get marks for one of these on a test, because that's going to be kind of important on Tuesday, I think you would agree. Okay, you would get a mark for identifying that this was a law of conservation of energy question. Okay, now, how can you tell the difference between a law of conservation of energy question and a work energy theorem question? Okay, well, that's how I would solve that kind of question. Okay, but what's going to be in a work energy theorem question that's not going to be in one of these? Okay, yeah, these will always have two speeds. There, there's a possibility that, that a, uh, a work energy theorem question could have two speeds if it was changing just the kinetic energy. Okay, but these kind of questions are always changing mechanical, or in other words, both. Okay, you don't have any work energy theorems where both are changing. Okay, and the second thing is, what's never getting done in one of these? Work. So if you see the word work, it is most likely a work energy theorem question. I don't say that to belittle your intelligence. I say that just because sometimes people get confused when, you know, it's a high pressure exam situation. Okay, you see the word work? It's a work energy theorem question. No work gets done in these. Okay, and in a work energy theorem question, you will often be given something that you're never given in here. Uh, no, you get heights here. Uh, no, you get joules. Well, you don't often get joules here. You're right. Okay, sometimes you'll get joules. Okay, you'll get mass sometimes in these two. Force. You never get force in a question like this, right? You only get force in a work energy theorem question because you have to go force times distance. Everybody with me there? So little things to look for because sometimes on a, on a test when you've got many different kinds of questions, it gets hard to identify which one is which. Okay, everyone with me there? So a little tip for, for Tuesday. All right, I want you to try this one now, please. All right, so for this one here, okay, we set it up. Okay, same as before. Okay, we got a cliff, car driving off the cliff, okay, at 25 meters per second. So this is like the end of Thelma and Louise, if you've ever seen that movie. Okay, you probably haven't, but it's like a cultural reference now. Okay, um, they drive this beautiful blue thunderbird off the, okay, off the cliff. They're still in it. It's sad. Anyway, they go, and they go off at 25 meters per second. We don't know how high the cliff is, but we do know that when they get to the bottom, okay, they're moving at 
meters per second. What do we also know they don't have at the bottom? Potential energy, right? Their, their height is zero. Right? So when we set this up, we can kind of shortcut a little bit, okay? not having to write quite everything down. So we have EP initial, okay, because we know they're on top of a cliff. Okay, we know they have kinetic energy because it tells us how fast they're going, but we know that at the end they only have kinetic energy. Okay? They have a lot of it because they're moving 53 meters per second. So, plug in our formulas here. MGHI plus one half MVI squared, my initial kinetic energy, okay, equals my final kinetic energy, like so. All right, what am I looking for again? I'm looking for the height of the cliff. Okay, so that's this term right here. Okay, we can cross off m because it's in every term still. We can get rid of that. What do I need to move right now? Right, I got to take the kinetic energy initial and move it over here. So minus or subtract from both sides. Okay, the one half vi squared. So we'll have ghi equals one half of vf squared minus one half of vi squared. Okay, and then I got to move G, so I'll divide both sides by G, right, and I've solved for HI. Okay, so when we plug in our numbers here, we're going to have 1 half times 53 squared minus 1 half times 25 squared divided by 9.81. Alright, so we'll find out how high the cliff is here. All right, it's a 111 meter cliff. It's a long way to fall. Okay, that would be several seconds of falling. Okay, yeah. Right. So 111 meter high cliff. All right, is that one making sense? Last example here. Now you've had two that have solved for height. What do you suppose the last one's going to ask you for? Yeah, for speed. Okay. Okay. So in this question, okay, skydiver jumps out of a plane, okay, and typically when you uh, jump out of a plane, there's a period of free fall. Okay. First, you just fall before you open your parachute. Right. Um, so what we're looking at here is a situation where the, the skydiver has what kinds of energy initially? Does potential and kinetic. Okay? It's not that he's moving downwards, he's not. Okay? But it doesn't matter if he's moving downwards. Okay? He's moving horizontally in the plane at 25 or at 90 meters per second, sorry. Okay? It's still kinetic energy because energy is not vector, it is scalar. So it doesn't care whether which direction you're moving, you just have that energy. All right. So in skydiving, you jump out of the plane with both kinds. Okay. And as you fall, your potential energy gets converted into kinetic. Now, when he's 8,000 meters above the ground, does he still have both kinds? Well, he's still 8,000 meters above the ground, so he better still have potential energy. And I would have to think he's probably moving faster at this point. Agreed? Okay. Anybody ever done this? No? Okay. I haven't either. My grandfather, on his 85th birthday, went skydiving. Yeah, crazy. Okay? 85th birthday. Bucket list, right? I guess when you get to be that age, jumping out of a plane is less scary. I don't know. Okay? But he did it. Saw the whole video. It was really cool. Okay. All right. So we've got initial mechanical energy being the same as the final mechanical energy because, again, there's no work being done. There's no mention of work in this question. Okay? Initially, we have potential energy and kinetic energy, and at the end, we have both. Okay. And so, plugging in our formulas here, MGHI plus one-half MVI squared equals MGHF plus one-half MVF squared. All right. We know that we've got all of these, okay? We know that since M is in all of them and we weren't told the mass of the skydiver anyway, it must not have been all that important, all right? So we're going to cancel it off. I need to solve for what here? 
VF. All right, so I'm looking for this thing right here, which means I need to move GHF. How do I do it? Subtract it. Okay, I'm moving what's not attached first, and I'm doing the opposite. So, GH, whoop, don't need the M, GHI plus one half VI squared, okay, equals, or sorry, not equals, minus GHF, okay, equals one half of VF squared. Now, what do I do? Divide by one half, and then square root, right. Uh, you guys are getting this. It's good. Okay. So now when I plug in my numbers here, okay, it's going to look like this. 9.81 times 10,000, okay, um, plus one half times 90 squared minus 9.81 times 8,000, okay, divided by one half. All right, so we've got a square root of all of this. Okay, so 9.81. Not enough brackets. Okay, 9.81 times 10,000. Okay, uh, minus 9.81. Not minus, plus. I'm having a hard time here this morning. Plus 0.5 times 90 squared. Okay, minus um, 9.81 times 8,000. Okay, divided by one half. Okay, so. 217 meters per second, 217.5 meters per second. Yeah, you wouldn't go that fast. Why not? In the real world, why would you not go that fast? There's resistance. Now, even if you haven't opened your parachute, you're not going to go that fast. Okay? There's something called terminal velocity. Heard that term before? Okay? It's the fastest you can move through the Earth's atmosphere due to your air resistance. All right? If you fall out of a plane, you will not go this fast. Because at, w at some point, the speed at which you move through the air okay, ceases to increase. All right? The reason for that is that the force of gravity and the force of air resistance become balanced as you go faster and faster. All right? And at that point, if there's no force left okay, um, that's out of balance, you stop accelerating. Okay? And you will travel at that constant speed all the way to the ground. Now, is that speed fixed? Like, is it always going to be the same? No, it has all kinds of variants. Okay, it can depend on the atmospheric pressure, it can depend on the temperature, and it can depend on your shape. Okay, if you've ever watched like the the skydiving teams and and the stuff that they do, if they want to fall really quickly, okay, they tuck in. Okay, they go like this and they stick their hands right beside their their hips. Okay, and they get really really small because then they fall. Yeah, they're more aerodynamic. They fall faster. When they want to fall slower, they get like spread eagled. Okay, and and they slow down. Okay and they don't fall as fast because they increase their wind resistance. All right? So things like that can affect that terminal velocity. But it is certainly slower than this number. Okay. It's not so much, I mean, it's, it has something to do with that, yeah. But they increase the air resistance against them, yeah. Uh, okay, I'd have to look at your calculator. Okay. Okay, so we're getting 217 meters per second there. Okay, are we getting this? All right, now, Mark's distribution, because I said I was going to show you that. Okay, you'd get a mark for this. You'd also get a mark for your givens, which we haven't written down. We should. We're get, I'm getting kind of a bad habit here of not doing it. Okay, so you get a mark for your givens. You get a mark for recognizing the type of question it is. Okay, I would probably give you a mark for this step here where you plugged in the formulas correctly. Okay, I would give you another mark. For your manipulation of the equation, I would give you another mark for your plugging in of the numbers. Okay, I would probably even give you a mark for this step up here. Okay, pretty generously, um, and then obviously a mark for the final answer. So we're looking at one, two, three, four, five, yeah, six. Right. So we're looking at six marks there. Sorry, seven marks for that question.
So it's worth a lot of marks. Make sure you show all your steps. It's not like it takes all that long to write them all down. Okay, helps you keep track of everything. Okay, since we're getting pretty confident with that, this should be kind of an easy seven mark question for all of us since we, we know they all essentially work the same. Okay, all right. I want you to finish up that worksheet I gave you the other day. Okay, uh, and we'll go through any ones that are giving you trouble on there. Remember, it does have a back side. Okay, so make sure you've done both sides of that worksheet. Okay, so we got a request here, guys, for number 13, okay, on the worksheet. So if you're there or not there or having trouble, okay, just have a peek here. So we have a 5,000 kilogram car coasts through a 50 meter long snow drift that's been blown onto the road. The car has a speed of 20 meters per second before it reaches the drift, and when it emerges, it's going slower, 8 meters per second. So what did the snow drift do to the car, or what, sorry, what did the car do to the snow drift? Yes. What do we call that, though? Four-letter word. starts with W. Well, I noticed I said starts with W, so I didn't get any answers I don't want to get. Okay? Work. Yeah. Okay? We, we got work being done on the snow drift. Well, if the car does work, does that mean it loses energy? Yes, it does. All right. So that's what we're looking for here. Okay? The work done on the snow drift is equal to the change in the kinetic energy of the car. All right? So we've got force times distance equals one-half MVF squared minus one half mvi squared, right? And we have both an initial and a final velocity here, okay? So we have to, uh, we have to include all of this. All right, if I want to find the force exerted on the car from the snow drift, I'm going to divide both sides by what? By d. All right, so now I've got my force. All I've got to do is plug in my numbers. All right, so the mass of the car was 5,000 kilograms. Oops, sorry, i got to put my halves in there. One half times 5,000 times my final velocity, which was 8 squared, minus one half times 5,000 okay, times 20 squared, okay, divided by the length of the snowdrift, because that's the distance over which the work would be done. All right, now, I'm going to get a negative number here, aren't I? Is that okay? Yeah, because from the car's point of view, it lost energy. That is negative work, and that's okay. Okay, The force then will also come out negative, and that's okay, because the force the snow drift exerted would be, from the car's point of view, backwards. Right? If you want to slow something down, you push in a direction opposite the way it's going. Agreed? So it's all right if we get a negative number here. I know the answer is not negative there, but that's okay. All right. So we will have right. 0.5 times 5,000 times 64 okay. minus 0.5 times 5,000 times 20 squared. Okay, divided by 50, yep, 16,800 newtons. Okay, questions on that one, guys? Any other ones giving us trouble? All right, now, just as a kind of a point to go along with this one, how did I know, other than the fact that on your sheet this says this is a work energy theorem question, okay, on an exam, how would I know this is a work energy theorem question and not a law of conservation of energy question? Right. It specifically asked me for force, and I know there's never force involved with the law of conservation of energy. And secondly, does the energy of this car clearly change in this question? Yes. Okay. It has less energy when it exits the snowdrift than when it went in, whereas a roller coaster or a toboggan going down a hill has the same energy. Yes, its kinetic and potential are changing, but its overall mechanical energy is not. Okay? In this case, the overall mechanical energy of the car is most definitely changing. Evan. All right, so on number 15, okay, it's asking you to calculate um, the potential, okay, um, 
sorry, the mechanical energy at each of the following heights. Okay, so this question sounds initially, when you first read it, like it's going to be a ton of work. Except that how many times do you realistically need to calculate the mechanical energy of this rock? Once, because the amount of mechanical energy this rock has is not going to what? It's not going to change. Okay, so the 2 kilogram rock is released from a height of 20 meters. What kind of energy does it have if it's being dropped? Just potential because it's not moving yet. So to calculate the mechanical energy, okay, I go EP plus EK. But since I'm dropping it, there isn't any of this. So all I have to do is go M times G times H. So that's going to be 2 kilograms times 9.81 times 20 meters. All right, so 19.62 times 20. Okay, it's 392.4 joules. All right, so calculate. So now it says, determine, ignoring air resistance, determine the kinetic energy and gravitational energy and total mechanical energy at each of the following heights. Okay, since I don't know the speed at any of those heights, I can't use one half mv squared to find the kinetic energy at any of those heights, can I? But since I know that this is the mechanical energy at all of those heights, and I know the heights, what kind of energy can I calculate at each of the heights? I can calculate the potential. Well, if I know what potential and kinetic add up to, 392.4, okay, and I know what the potential is at each one of the heights, can I find kinetic? Yeah, I'll just go EK equals mechanical minus EP and I'll have it for each height. Okay, so I'll show you the example here at 15 meters, and then you guys can do the others. All right, so at 15 meters, we'll have 392.4 minus M times G times H equals EK, so that'll be 392.4 minus um, 20, sorry, 2, not 20, 2 times 9.81 times 15. So, it has 98.1 joules of energy at, of kinetic energy, sorry, at 15 meters. Everybody all right with that? Okay, you see where we're going from there? How much kinetic energy does it have at the bottom? This much, right? 392.4, because at, at the bottom, it doesn't have any potential anymore, right? Okay, so at the top, this number was all potential. At the bottom, this number is going to be all kinetic. It's the only, you only have to do calculations for 15 and 10. Okay, the, the first one, the 20, the starting point, and 0, you don't have to do any calculating for, as long as you understand that mechanical energy is EP plus EK. All right, does that answer your question, Evan? Okay. Any other ones, guys? <coughs> All right, keep her going. Okay. So on 14, okay, when we start this question, the pole vaulter has what kind of energy? Kinetic. Once she leaves the ground, is there any work being done after that? None. Okay, so is this a law of conservation of energy question? It has to be. We were never given force. It never mentions force. It never mentions work. Okay? So we know that the energy she has on the ground is going to determine how high she can go. It says that right in the question. All right? At her maximum height, what kind of energy does she have? Potential. Potential only. Whenever you throw something up in the air, okay, at its maximum height, how fast is it going? Zero, because it slows down all the way to there, and at that point, it instantaneously is stopped before it begins to fall back down. All right, so our initial energy is all kinetic, and our final energy is all potential. Now, that's not true in the truest sense of pole vault, where you're actually moving a little bit horizontally, but we're simplifying here. Okay. All right, I'm trying to find the maximum height she can reach, assuming only her speed determines the maximum height. All right, so I divide both sides by m times g. The m's cancel, okay, which is good because they never did tell me her mass. 
Okay? Um, and now I can solve for HF by plugging in the numbers. So 1 half times 9 squared over 9.81 okay, should give me 4.12 meters. Okay, everybody right with that one? Well, yes, because it's the same person on both sides, right? Their mass isn't changing. The only time you would have to keep mass in would be if they asked you for the kinetic energy as opposed to a speed or a height, okay? Or if they asked you for the potential energy because mass is part of energy, okay? On a test, I don't usually ask for the energy. I usually ask for height or, or speed. Okay, so I've got a, a number of people asking here, um, what's going on between question number one and question number two, okay, on the first part of the back page there, okay? So calculating the kinetic energy of a 750 kilogram car moving at 14 meters per second is easy. We plug in it, we plug in the stuff into one half mv squared, okay? No one's confused on that part. The part that people are confused about is, why is in the second question the number negative? So when the car is moving at 14 meters per second, it has kinetic energy, agreed? If you want it to stop, what do you have to do with that kinetic energy? You've got to use it. You've got to take it away. You've got to make it do work so that the car no longer has it. The car has to transfer it away. And work is a transfer of energy, agreed? Okay, from the car's point of view, if it transfers away or does 73,500 joules worth of work, it would then have no energy, agreed? So from its point of view, would it have done negative work? Yes, because it now has that much less energy. Okay? If I want something to be stopped, and I know that it's got a certain amount of kinetic energy, I have to take it all away, and I have to turn it into something else. Okay? Your car does that when you apply the brakes. Okay? The brakes turn your kinetic energy into heat and sound. Okay? So you can hear them, you can hear your tires okay, on, the, on the road, and the brake rotors, believe me, get very, very hot. All right? You would not want to, after coming to rest from 14 meters per second, reach through the wheel and touch the brake rotor. Okay? You would most certainly burn your finger. All right? Is everyone following me there? So the work is negative if something does work on something else. Okay? Now, in this case, from the brake rotor point of view, or from the surroundings point of view, the work would be positive because the heat is going to go into the environment and as a result it's going to gain that energy okay but from the car's point of view the work is negative because it has transferred that energy away everyone all right with that so number two doesn't require any calculating it only requires an understanding of work energy theorem if i do work that's negative from my point of view it's positive from whatever i did the work's point of view on okay and the other one's giving us trouble there yep For kinetic, this one, this one right here. Okay, so 2.2 times 10 to the 6 joules of work are done to accelerate a 5,700 kilogram trailer truck to 26 meters per second. How fast would it go if half as much work was done? Okay, so if I only did half as much work, how much energy would it have? Half of this, right? Okay, so can I use that then as the kinetic energy it would have if I only did half as much work? and all the other numbers remain the same, right? Okay, I just solve for the new V instead of for 26. Okay, you guys, you follow me there? So then the new number, half of this, will be EK. All right, you will have a quiz tomorrow. It will be posted later today. Conservation of energy, EI equals EF. All right, so have a look at that tonight. Okay, also remember that tomorrow your work labs are due. Okay, and the day after that, your energy conversion lab is due. So make sure you're getting all that stuff done. Don't get behind. Okay? Because, guys, after that, all you have is your exam, and I will assign you nothing over Christmas. I promise. Okay? I think Christmas is for spending time with your family and not doing homework. I don't know if you agree with me on that or not, but it doesn't matter if you do.